Six more minutes.
One more minute till showtime. Did you say one minute? I think so. Okay. Next time, let's make Karen say that. Okay. That ain't gonna happen, but okay. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Seven, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Chances are pretty good that you've had a tough week and now you're ready to rest on God's seventh day Sabbath. And chances are you're just like us in that we look at the Sabbath not as a burden, but as a blessing. We love reading God's fourth commandment in Exodus 20, where he tells us to rest. Yeah, and personally, I feel really, really sorry for people who work seven days a week. People who work seven days a week really don't know what they're missing by not having one day to rest. Yeah, and we look at the seventh day Sabbath like this. Each one of us is a creation of God. You know how God formed Adam on the sixth day of creation week. And then God breathed life into the, that first man. Each of us is a creation of God. Just like a Ford Mustang is a creation of the Ford Motor Company. And as our creator, God gives us a manual that, like the Ford Motor Company, provides a manual for every new car it makes. And that manual, the Bible, tells us that we are to rest <laughs> one day a week. God knows what's best for us because he created us. So we hope you enjoy God's Sabbath as much as we do. Because we love it a lot. We enjoy going to church with other believers. We enjoy fellowshipping. We enjoy resting. We enjoy studying the Bible. And we enjoy being with you week after week on Start Our Sabbath. So we thank you very much for being here tonight. It is our privilege to serve you. That's right. Last week we received a prayer request from Pastor Raju Amruth in India. He's asking for prayers for his congregation. He ministers to lepers in India. Yeah, and, and sometimes when we get contacted by people, they ask us for money. But Pastor Amruth was very specific in that he said he only wants prayers. <clears throat> so, would you please add this congregation to your prayer list? And this is the group that's pastored by Brother Amruth in India. That's right. Now, before we get too far into the show, Wes wants to mention a quick point. And Nancy thinks this is not a quick point. It's but never I think a quick it's point. Never, right. Okay. It's never yeah. Right. Too many times Christians have a tendency to. Oh, uh, let's see. Slide. Am I supposed to have a slide? Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, too many times. Thank you. Christians have a tendency to only open their Bibles in church, and that's a mistake. If you do that, if you're only opening your Bible in church, you're missing out on a great blessing. And I say this because the messages that you get from your pastors, from your ministers, from this show, whatever. This should only be a small part of what you learn from the Bible. And I love this picture of the iceberg. This meme <coughs> says that your Bible study should be like an iceberg. And, and you know, when you look at an iceberg, you know that most of the iceberg is underwater. 
When you see uh, above, what you see above the surface is actually just a small part of the iceberg. Using this analogy, we see that we must learn about the Bible from other people and what we learn from them should be very small because what you learn about the Bible in your own personal study, that should be the biggest part of your overall Bible learning. Now, quite often, people will pray a lot in their lives. You know, they're in the car a lot, so they can pray a lot. And they say, well, I don't have time for Bible study. And when they do something like this, you know, they, they, they ask the question, they say, well, if I, if I do... Excuse me, if I do more Bible study, I'll have to cut back on my prayer time. And they look at prayer and Bible study as an either-or situation. And it shouldn't be that way. We've got to find time for both prayer and Bible study. And then sometimes a person might even ask a question like this. Well, which is more important, prayer or Bible study? And to that question, I would answer, what's more important, breathing in or breathing out? You need both. you got to do both, prayer and Bible study. All right, back to Bible study. As I mentioned, too many Christians open their Bibles only when they're in church, and that's a mistake. And please don't misunderstand. Sermons and Bible studies at church are great. And when you hear a sermon or a Bible study at church or on this show, you should always take notes. Because the purpose of your hearing these sermons and studies should be mainly just to spark a thought. These sermons and studies are to generate your thinking. It's to get the wheels rolling in your mind. Sermon and Bible studies should make you start asking questions. Please don't look at sermons and Bible studies as an end unto themselves. No, they should be a means to an end. Because after you hear the sermon or Bible study, you should set aside blocks of time during the week. And it's within these blocks of time, that's when you delve really deeply into these subjects with prayer and meditation. It's within these blocks of time where you develop your thoughts and ideas and questions as you dig deeply into God's Word. Remember that prayer is how you talk to God. And then how does God talk back to us? Well, one way is that we know that in the multitude of counsel, there's wisdom. So in a sense, God talks to us when we get advice from other people who have the Holy Spirit. But the main way that God talks to us is through His written Word. This is how we have two-way two communication with God. It's in your personal Bible study where God talks to you. This is where he answers your questions. So please never rely on us or other people to be your primary source of Bible study. Personal Bible study should be the big chunk of your overall Bible study, the, the iceberg. Personal Bible study should be the biggest part of your iceberg. So please make personal Bible study a regular part of your life because if you do, it won't be long before you start seeing what a great blessing it is to do personal Bible study. One final thought. you got to have the right attitude when you study your Bible. Bible study and your relationship with God are not a one-way street where all you do is get, get, get from God. Some folks want their Bible study to be where they only receive comfort and inspiration. But please keep the following in mind. You have no right to go to the Bible for comfort and inspiration unless you're willing to go to it equally for instruction and correction. Because as you get, get, get these blessings from God, you got to give back in the form of repentance and obedience. So in your Bible, in your Bible study, <clears throat> always look for instruction and correction to go along with all the comfort and inspiration that you receive. All right, let's close this out now. Nancy and I are going to read five scriptures about God's written word. And if you want to turn to these scriptures as we read them, that's fine. But since we're going to go through them really quickly, because we've got a lot of material on, the, on this show, you might want to just write them down so you can read them later and meditate on them. Because these five scriptures are really inspirational. Let's go through these quickly. Nancy? Hebrews 4.12, For the word of God is alive and active, sharper than a double-edged sword. It penetrates even to the dividing of soul and spirit, joints and marrow, it judges the thoughts and attitudes of the heart. Psalm 119.15 says, I will study your commandments and reflect on your ways. I will delight in your decrees and not forget your word. Joshua 1.8, this book of the law shall not depart from your mouth, but you shall meditate on it day and night, so that you may be careful to do according to all that is written in it. For you will make, <clears throat> for then you will make your way prosperous, and then you will have good success. Matthew 4.4, 4. but Jesus answered, 
It is written, man does not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. Psalm 119, 96 through 98. To all perfection I see a limit, but your commands are boundless. Oh, how I love your law. I meditated on it all day long. Your commands are always with me and make me wiser than my enemies. So please stay in the written word. Spend lots of time in the Bible and study, prayer, meditation. Okay, let's move on. Nancy, what have you got? Um, I, you know, I don't know how the weather has been in all the other parts of the country where the viewers are watching. Well, actually, I should say other parts of the world. Yeah, that's right, because we've now got viewers from the Philippines, India, Pakistan, Kenya, Uganda, and the United Arab Emirates, all kinds of places. And we appreciate every one of you. Again, we thank you for being with us every Friday evening. And always talk to us in the chat room. Tell us where you're from. We want to know where you're from. That's right. Anyway, I have to tell you that out here in Texas... This has been a quite a winter. We've been having some really cold weather over the last couple of months. Yeah, and don't I know it? Like, because I go out and I work on our property all the time, working my chores. A couple Sundays ago, I came in. It was just flat out too cold to be out there in that weather. It was just too cold. And I said to Nancy, I said, "Man, my hands are freezing." I remember that. That's when I told you next time wear gloves. Well, yeah, you said that, but I was hoping for a solution that started with poor baby and ended with hot chocolate <laughs> well maybe next time yeah right okay uh let's see um your line nancy all right once again we want to tell you about a facebook page called seventh day sabbath keepers this is a great <clears throat> page it has over seventeen thousand followers and you gotta admit that seventeen thousand followers that's a lot of followers almost as many girlfriends as you had growing up anyway we recommend you check it out again uh it's called sabbath day our no, Seventh Day Sabbath Keepers. Seventh Day Sabbath <laughs> Easy Keepers. Easy for me to say. Yeah, and the guy who runs Seventh Day Sabbath Keepers is our good friend from California, Bill Lucenhide. And um, we've got him on the show tonight, as usual. So I want to say uh, good evening, Bill. Well, hello, Wes and Nancy. Certainly hello to all of our audience here on Stock for Sabbath. And may I add that with Seventh Day Sabbath Keepers, we have 17,000 followers of Jesus Christ and the Sabbath that he revealed, <laughs> certainly not followers of Bill Lucenheider and yeah. secular group. And again, my pleasure in being with you, and certainly thank you guys for letting me add some commentary and some color to your wonderful presentation this evening. We're glad to have you. Bill, while we've got you on the line, would you please do the opening prayer? No, thank you, Wes. Father in heaven, great eternal God, we do praise you for your amazing creative abilities of the giant galaxies that are hung about the, the universe, billions, hundreds of billions of them, hundreds of billions of stars in each. We marvel in that, and we marvel, though, at your greatest creation, which is us, mankind, that you made in your own <clears throat> image, and all of the wonderful potential that is there. And you gave your son for us to have eternal life, to be with you for eternity, and what an amazing calling it is. At this time, here on this day, the Sabbath rest, I would like to mention Pastor Amor in India, who's ministering to lepers, people that are in great distress, and just pray for their healing, blessing for the pastor in every way, shape, or form, Father, as he ministers again to these marvelous human beings that you created in your image. So, Father, be with us, be with the show this evening, inspire it, help us to learn, help us have fun, help us have fellowship, and thank you for calling us to be your people. And we pray in Jesus Christ's name. Amen. Amen. Okay, thank you, Bill. All right, let's get uh, let's get into our first segment. If you watched the uh, show last time, you probably remember Nancy talked about the Me Too movement. And as a result of her talk, I said after her segment that I want to talk about women dressing modestly because 1 Timothy 2.8 says, Therefore, I want the men everywhere to pray, lifting up holy hands without anger and disputing. I also want the women to dress modestly with decency and propriety, adorning themselves not with elaborate hairstyles or gold or pearls or expensive clothes, but with good deeds appropriate for women who profess to worship God. Well, Nancy got me distracted this last week, so I didn't get to put this all together, but I'm hoping to do it next week. We'll see. Why do you not want me to talk about women dressing modestly? Because you're probably going to end up offending half our audience. But you don't even know what I'm going to say. That's my point exactly. I have no idea what you're going to say and how you're going to handle this sensitive topic. And that's what scares me. <laughs> All right. Let's, let's, you be that way. Let's move on. Tonight I want to give you a quick update on a show that we did several weeks ago. 
It was on SOS 45 where we talked about giants and Nephilim and Rephaim. And if you missed that show, you can find it by going to our website, dynamicchristianministries.org. And when you get to the website, click onto the YouTube button and it'll list all of our previous shows. So if you want to watch our show on giants and Nephilim and Rephaim, go to uh, SOS 45 and you'll get our presentation on the giants. But please don't do that now. No, please not right now. Do it later. <laughs> now, in that show, we talked about how Neanderthals were not just a bunch of stupid cavemen. They were intelligent. And actually, they had a, large, uh, a larger brain capacity than we have. The human species that exist today. Again, that's SOS 45. But tonight, I want to give you a quick update on Neanderthals because there's a new scientific uh, uh, study that's going on. There's some new information on this subject that was just released this past week. This is brand new stuff. It's not even in the uh, big journals yet. It just hit the newspapers. The Los Angeles Times published an interesting science article entitled, Cave Art Proves Neanderthals Were Just As Sophisticated As Us. It was written by Deborah Netburn, N-E-T-B-U-R-N. She's a science reporter. And if you want to read the whole article, Google just three words, Deborah Netburn Neanderthals, and the whole article will pop up. Here's a small part of what the article relates regarding the latest discoveries by uh, the anthropologists today. First, the article talks about the Neanderthal cave paintings that were recently found in Spain. This is a first because archaeologists have never seen Neanderthal art before. So this recent discovery was really surprising to the world of science. And now these scientists are studying this astounding new information. Here's a quote from the article, quote, Matthew Pope, an archaeologist at the University College of London, said the new study won't necessarily change how he and his colleagues think about Neanderthals. It says, at this point, many of them have already concluded that our ancient relatives had gotten a woefully short shrift in the past. He said, Neanderthals may have looked different than modern humans, but cognitively, it appears they were just like us. All right, I'm leaving the quote now. As you know, I believe... All this ties in with Cain when he killed his brother Abel before the flood. That's in SOS 45. All right, back to the article. He says, for most of the last century, in the 20th century, researchers have argued that our Neanderthal cousins were intellectually inferior to their modern human contemporaries. That's us. Still quoting, however, archaeological evidence revealed over the last two decades tells a different story. We now know that Neanderthals were sophisticated hunters who knew how to control fire and that they adorned themselves with jewelry and took care to bury their dead. Still quoting, in addition, genetic evidence suggests that modern humans and Neanderthals were similar enough that they interbred with some frequency. And finally, the last quote, it says, indeed, get this now, if you are of European or Asian descent, it is likely that roughly 2% of your genome comes from Neanderthal ancestors, end quote. This is fascinating. And I want to reiterate one of the main points of the article, which is that for the longest time, atheistic agno and agnostic scholars have claimed that you and I are evolved from lowly, stupid Neanderthals and that the human race has gotten better and better over the millennia. And actually, the opposite is the truth. Anyway, the scientists now realize that they were wrong when they viewed Neanderthals as inferior subhumans. They now realize that these Neanderthals were not inferior creatures. They were just as smart and as sophisticated as you and I are. Now I gotta add this point in, I gotta put a little thing. I gotta say that the faculty of Ambassador College was way ahead of its time in this area because they were teaching back in the 1960s that Neanderthals were intelligent creatures. And they were teaching that the Neanderthals did not exist before man. No, they were contemporaries of modern man during the pre-flood age. Ambassador College was teaching this when most scientists believed that Neanderthals and humans didn't live at the same time and that the Neanderthals were precursors to the human race. And let me interject another important point. Not everything that was taught by Ambassador College was good. We know that. They taught some incorrect things, and I can say that. I was there. I was part of the faculty. But usually they taught some really good things. And when someone or some group gets it right, I want to give them kudos. But when a church or some ministry does a good thing, 
Let's acknowledge that, that they did a good thing. And some of our viewers get mad when I do this. Like a year or so ago when I spoke uh, in a complimentary way about the Church God Seventh Day while I was still on bots. And you wouldn't believe the pushback that I got from some ministers because I was saying nice things about Church God Seventh Day. It's important for us to be encouraging of other Christians whenever possible. When, when, when they're wrong on something, we say they're wrong. When they're right on something, we need to say, at a boy. And I'm going to stick with my statement that Ambassador College was ahead of their time on a whole lot of teachings. Anyway, remember that you can read this article about the latest discoveries regarding Neanderthals by Googling three words, Deborah Nedberg Neanderthals. And you can watch our show about Neanderthals, Nephilim Giants, and Rephaim Giants by going to our website, dynamicchristianministries.org. Uh, hit the YouTube button, click on the show. Was, did I say 44 or 45? Ooh, I can't remember. Uh, anyway, watch them all. Watch them all. Anyway. There's only 40 <clears throat> something. This, this, this show attempts to put giants into the overall timeline of human history going back to the earliest days of mankind during the time of Adam and Eve and their first descendants. Uh, Bill, um, we, uh, all this stuff that we discuss sometimes, it, uh, it, it can be quite controversial. What are your thoughts tonight on how we can best uh, discuss this type of topic with non-believers? Well, Wes, uh, let me just tell you this, that I have known a number of Neanderthals right now living here <laughs> in my lifetime, okay? okay. <laughs> but in all seriousness, and, and I thought what you had there on the screen was a rock star from a rock band. So, <laughs> it kind of looked uh, like there it. There should be a group called the Neanderthals uh, uh, with a rock group. But in all seriousness, Science is pretty arrogant in pigeonholing a lot of ideas when it comes to origin. But the problem comes up with the fact that you cannot reproduce the past here in the present for what is called an observable, measurable result. And that's what is part of the scientific method. You, just, you can't apply the scientific method in trying to analyze something that happened in the past. But beyond just Neanderthals and their place in history, the origin of life itself is fraught with all kinds of assumptions and guesses, giant leaps of faith, statements like, well, somehow it, those amino acids just got together somehow. And it takes more faith to believe in evolution, at least in my case, than it does to have faith in God as the primal source of the universe. My advice in regards to the secular pre-Genesis history is to learn it. Learn all about it. Actually, learn about what evolutionists are saying. I'm not saying to believe in it but to understand it mm -hmm. and understand their arguments so that we may always be able to reasonably discuss things with non-believers, but realize that it is theory that the world has. It's not a set of facts, and as such, all knowledge of this is just speculation and conjecture and not hard, cold proof. Yeah, very good. Thank you, Bill. Nancy, what do you got going on in the chat room tonight? I'm going to start with YouTube tonight. We have Barb Shanks from Montgomery, Alabama, Rick Four, Trudy Cranford, Birgit Sellers, Robert G. from Long Island, New York, and Al Bundy 59. Hi, y'all. Glad to have you with us tonight. We sure are. Of course, we've got Mimi in Canada and Carl in North Carolina. We've got Dan Kranz, uh, Roxanne uh, Cast, Richard Maxwell from Rocky Ridge, Bob Petty um, from Minnesota, and he said he's sick of winter, so we shouldn't even talk about winter when we got people from Minnesota no <laughs> watching the show. Um, let's see, uh, Bill L., Roger Martin, Willow Al Love, Kevin O'Hare, otherwise known as Kevin from Hessville, Rod Kuzman, David Lynn, Bernard Carmen, Xavier St. Hope, Mike and Denise Simple. Benita Miller, Verge Cordell, Robert Murphy, Beth Lane Meese from Illinois, Amy Hohertz from the Dallas area, Anosh uh, Shabats, Sharon Lewis, Rita Bertaki, Rita Orgel, Aaron Mabry, O'Neill Freeman, Tim Rose, Celine Gabriel, Jerry Stubbs, Christy Gerald, Susan Todd, Randy Freeze, <coughs> uh, Michael McCarthy, who's from Florida, where we all want to be in the cold weather. Yeah. Derek Huntley, Horse Obermite from Kinley, North Carolina. Oh, I forgot the Simples are from Sioux City, Iowa. Oh, okay, very good. Faye Brown from East Texas, not very far from us. Scott yeah. Gilbert, uh, Margaret Ellis, John Black, Sony Cruz, Derba um, Sharitha, 
And that's all the ones I wrote down. Um, and Vaporo Salve came in while I was talking. Thank you everyone for checking in. We did have someone. Let's see. Um, who was it? Bill Lucenhide. Oh, wait. He doesn't we don't know. want to talk about him. No. Uh, no, we did have Roger Martin remind everybody to hit the share button. Thank you, Roger. So he jumped the gun there. You got <coughs> your share yeah, good. emoji, and we want to remind you to share. Nancy, tell us about the women's conference. Thing. It is getting so close. It's April 21st and 22nd. Uh, physically, if you can make it, it's in Tyler, Texas at the CGI <coughs> building. But if you want to know anything and everything, about the women's conference you can go to newchurchlady.org it's got the schedule it's got information about the speakers there's registration there's all the details about where you can find it online and join us in the chat room when you can't join us in the um when you can't join us in person so no. it's a Damn. the first time that we've had it online in this way so you One can more. everywhere that you can find cgi um uh, YouTube, Facebook, on their website, you can find it there. So that's all I'm going to tell you, except for Anika Hansen is going to be uh, speaking with us again this year. Everybody enjoyed her. She's one of our keynote speakers. And Paula Hughes, who is a professional speaker, does a lot mm -hmm. of training things. She's going to be speaking. We've got roundtables. We've got a whole bunch of stuff. Please come or yeah. join us online. Or join us online. That's Very right. good. All right, let's get into our second segment. Uh, Nancy, what have you got for us tonight? Well, calm down <coughs> forever. You saw the you saw the sign last week. Uh, now, if you haven't seen the Marvel movie Black Panther, I promise not to give any spoilers away tonight. If you never intend to see it, don't worry. You don't need to see it in order to follow me tonight. First of all, I gotta admit, I'm a complete geek when it comes to superheroes. Marvel Comics, DC Comics, love them all. Mostly because I love a hero who swoops in, <coughs> rights all the wrongs, save the innocents, protect the world from evil, <laughs> evil, and typically good triumphs over evil by the end of a two hour movie. Well, <clears throat> that's when we're dealing with these fictional superheroes. The universe's real superhero is Jesus Christ, and someday he'll return to put away evil totally <coughs> and forever. Godspeed that day. Until that time, our entertainment industry offers us fantasies about their ideas about superheroes and how to right the wrongs of this world. And that brings me to the Black Panther movie. This movie is being called the first Marvel movie with a political message. In the story, part of the struggle is between those who want the fictional nation of Wakanda uh, there who wants it, th them to protect their greatest asset, a natural mineral called vibranium. On the other side who those are those who feel that they need to keep the world from finding it. And they're in conflict with some who feel they owe it to the world to share the vibra uh, vibranium, either in the raw form or in weaponry. So it's these two sides that are fighting. The movie's plot is a battle between extreme nationalism, note I said extreme, and a more globalist view of responsibility and duty. And I have no intention of taking on the subject from a political or national standpoint. Nope. Or not political on this show. Nope. I'm not even going to discuss the kind of God and country mixing of Christianity with national pride we sometimes see in this world's religions. And I think that phenomenon's a, phenomenon's a little more prevalent here in the United States than other countries. But we're not going to talk about it. But we're not going to talk about okay. it. So instead of tackling that topic, I want to share a few thoughts about the nationalistic pride that exists in your church, or my church, or churches out there. Your 501c3 organization versus what I call the globalist Christianity. You see, as believers who are part of some organization, we have our buildings, our income, our resources, our information, all that. And if we're not careful, we can be all about protecting what we have from other believers, instead, when instead we should be figuratively opening the storehouses and sharing it with the world. And gasp, even share it with other 501c3 corporations that we might consider to be in direct competition with us for members. Now, I have known of Sabbath-keeping church corporations that would not rent their buildings to other Sabbath-keeping churches. And why wouldn't they? Well, I'm not sure. Because I can't imagine a valid reason for not sharing. No. They might say something like this, though. Even though our services are in the afternoon, once in a while we might need our building in Sabbath morning. To me, that seems like an odd reason to turn your brothers away. Ah, but we all too easily come up with reasons not to call people our brothers anyway, don't we? Let's be honest, don't we do that? Yep. We do, unfortunately. 
I have known of churches who, after a split, wouldn't share their double set of basketball uniforms with the brethren who left them. I've known church organizations that got hacked off because a preacher or the pastor wasn't asked to preach at a funeral in his building, a funeral of a believer, but then they allow their building to be used by the sectarian community, and sometimes they let them use it for free. So I have to ask a question. How does all this square with Matthew 10, 8? Heal the sick, cleanse the lepers, raise the dead, cast out devils. Freely you have received, freely give. Would you say that one more time, please, that last line? I'd be happy to. Freely you have received, freely give. Thank you. And what about Matthew 5, 44 through 48? But I say unto you, love your enemies, bless those that curse you, do good to them that hate you, and pray for them which despitefully use you and persecute you, that you may be the children of your Father which is in heaven. For he makes the sun to shine on the evil and on the good, and sends rain on the just and on the unjust. For if you love them which love you, what reward have you? Do not even the publicans the same. And if you salute your brethren only, what uh, do you do more than others? Do not even the publicans so. Be you therefore perfect, even as your Father which in heaven is perfect. If we're expected to have this much love and care for enemies, surely greater is expected when dealing with a brother in Christ who tends another, quote, rival congregation. Sometimes it's not even things that we seek to hold back for ourselves. Sometimes we're guilty of hoarding of credit for ideas and programs. That's just crazy. Sure, we can justify this by saying, well, it's just human. But aren't we called, we aren't called to be human in our walk with Christ. We're called to fight our carnality. Of course, this type of behavior is reasonable and logical from a human standpoint. People by nature are selfish and stingy. On the other hand, People being open and sharing is not that common in Satan's world, and neither is following that. Uh, neither is the following that common in Satan wor Satan's world. What we find in First Kings seventeen, seven through sixteen, where God sent Elijah to the widow of Zarephath. Elijah uh, asks for a morsel of bread from her. If you remember the story, and she replies, "As the Lord your God lives, I have nothing baked. Only a handful of flour in a jar and a little oil in a jug." And now I'm gathering a couple of sticks that I may go in and prepare it for my son and myself that we might eat it and die. Elijah tells her to do it anyway. Make that cake for him, promising her that God will provide. So she does it. She gives the last food she has to Elijah. Literally the last meal in her home. She gives it to Elijah. And then God keeps his promise to provide. Why? Because she obeyed and gave everything. This is the kind of Christianity God asks of us. This is the kind of Christianity that should be, we should be practicing. This is the kind of Christianity that makes our light shine to the world. So rather than saying things like, Dynamic Christian Ministries forever, CGI forever, CEM forever, UCG forever, Cogwell forever, CGF7 forever, or whatever your church group is, we need to be saying, Jesus Christ forever. Jesus alone was crucified for you. Any asset, information, or anything we have is only by His grace and provision. The reason we possess these things in the first place is for the very purpose of giving it away. Wait a minute, wait a minute. What's the reason we possess all things? Say that again. The reason we possess these things is for the very purpose <coughs> of giving it all away. Yes. Sharing it with fellow brother or brunch or snacks and serve them the meal without asking for any contribution. What if one church with a building proactively offered the, the use of their building for free to a competitive group to use for a dance or Bible study or fundraiser of their own? <coughs> when we say we're called to share what we have, this applies to us both as individuals and as an organization, which is is just made up of individuals anyway. Mm -hmm. I know of a minister who is from a truly sharing church, mm -hmm. and I recently heard him say that he felt that they were fast. He felt that they were fast running out of cloaks to give. He was, of course, referring to Luke six twenty nine through thirty. strikes you on the one cheek off the other. And from 
Him who takes away your cloak, do not withhold your tunic either. Give to everyone who asks of you, and from whom who takes away your goods, do not ask them back. He was referring to this when he said his group was fast running out of cloaks to give. To you, sir, I say, it's a good problem to have. Please don't be discouraged. If you run out of physical things to share, you'll still have love and hope and light and peace to share with with uh, other people and your more grabby <coughs> brethren. And Jesus will say, well done, good and faithful servant. So you're giving advice to this very sharing ministry. I am. Very good. I'm trying to encourage him. Yeah, the guy the guy that she's talking about, and we're not going to give his name, He's he really has a true <coughs> serving heart. And I know that he probably will never run out of cloaks to give because he's really, really unselfish. Also, he understands the principle of forgiving 70 times 7. Exactly. Yeah. And those who are like this man who have giving attitudes know that if your group shares what you have with other churches, you run the risk of them taking advantage of you. You do. They might even use what you give them unwisely. And if you extend the name brother and the right hand of fellowship to these other groups, you may not be treated like a brother or a fellow co-worker in Christ in return. But guess what? You do it anyway. Do it anyway. Wakanda was meant to be the symbol of an advanced, peaceful society ruled by a leader who really cared for his people. Their fault? They were too insular, too nationalistic. They forgot at it for a time that there was a whole wide world out there that they could help to, to do better and to be better and to, to live better, starting with their own family. Note that I've changed my signs. Messiah forever. Jesus Christ forever. God speed that day. Very good. Thank you, Nancy. Bill, what are your thoughts on this? You know, fighting over scraps of bread. That's what we do as brethren. Fighting over scraps of bread. It is such a huge world. There's so much out there. There's so much of a field to be harvested. There's room for everybody. Yeah. In fact, we don't even have enough workers, not even close. We haven't even scratched the surface here in the United States, let alone places like India and Russia and China. And yet, well, it's the spirit of man that, that wants to sneak in to create these types of divisions. I'd like to quote a scripture, 1 Corinthians 3, verse 1. Okay. Brothers and sisters, I could not address you as a people who live by the Spirit, but as people who are still worldly, mere infants in Christ. I gave you milk, not solid food, for you were not ready yet for it. Indeed, you are still not ready. You are still worldly. For, now listen to this, for since there is jealousy and quarreling among you, are you not worldly? Are you not acting like mere carnal humans? For when one says, I follow Paul, and another says, I follow Apollos, are you not acting like mere human beings? But after all, what is Apollos? What is Paul? Only servants to whom came to believe, as the Lord has assigned to each his task. I planted the seed, Apollos watered it, and God has been making it grow. So neither the one who plants nor the one who waters is anything, but only God who makes things grow. The one who plants and the one who waters have one purpose, and they will be rewarded each according to their own labor. For, now this is important, let us remember this, for we are co-workers in God's service, and you are God's field, God's building. Brethren, God has not entrusted anyone or any group or any 501c3 to the exclusive franchise to doing his work. As much as possible, let us cooperate and help those whenever possible in their efforts to spread the gospel. Luke said, John, as Jesus said in Luke 9.50, whoever is not against us is for us. Very good. Thank you, Bill. Nancy, what do you got going on in the chat room? I'm just going to read a couple of things. Uh, Richard Maxwell says, we share our fellowship hall with AA on Sunday morning and have done so for over 20 years. That's good. great. Uh, Bob Petty mentioned uh, when you're talking about Neanderthals, Arnold Mendez conducts seminars on Noah's Ark and early man. And I think, I think I've heard one of his seminars. Okay. I think he has a miniature of the Ark. Uh, among other things, he thinks Neanderthals were Homo sapiens of advanced age. And if you're interested in more, Bob put a link in the chat room. Okay. So. 
I just that's all I really wanted to read for, okay. from the chat. All right. Oh, no, one more. one more. Reed Harding Bradwell says, It would be a blessing if all COGs could work for the common good. Our congregation is independent and would love to have a get-togethers with other COGs from time to time. So there is this sharing attitude out there. And um, sometimes it's the bigger <coughs> groups that, that are unsharing. It can even be the smaller groups. But if yeah. you find a group that won't share with you, you just share with them and, and hope they you know grow from it. Yeah, one of the most common things I hear people talking about is, wouldn't it be nice if on like a Pentecost or the Feast of Trumpets that we could get together with all the COGs in our area, mm -hmm. you know, and, and they lament that the brethren want this, the majority of them, it's not unanimous, but the, the majority of them want this, but it's, it's the leaders who stop this from happening. Mm -hmm. The <laughs> leaders could get this done just by clicking their fingers, making a decision, mm -hmm. shaking hands on a deal and getting it done. And, but they just won't do it, and it's most unfortunate. It seems like they worry about things like how we're going to handle the offering and who yeah. gets to speak and stuff like yeah. that. Yeah, who's going to lead songs, mm -hmm. who gets to do the prayer. Okay, let's not dwell on that. Before we get into our third and final segment tonight, I want to share a little something with you. I just received the latest Bible Advocate. It's published by the Church of God Seventh Day in Denver. And it has this month's issue has a fascinating article by Robert Coulter, and the article has to do with church history. Now, speaking personally for me, few things in life are more fun than two things. One, anything written by Robert Coulter. I'm a fan of his. Brother Coulter is the historian of the Church God Seventh Day. He's He was also the pastor of the Grand Prairie, Texas Church God Seventh Day congregation when I attended there in the 90s. Wonderful, godly man, full of Christian love. All right, second thing. The Bible Advocate talks about the history of doctrinal development in Church God Seventh Day. And you know I love history. Now, the history of the Church of God's Seventh Day is not that they came up with a set of doctrines when they first started in 1860 and said, oh, we can't change these doctrines. They didn't say, well, these doctrines that we have today have to be the same in 1860 and have to remain the same until Jesus returns. That was never their approach. Now, let's make something clear. Church of God's Seventh Day has always had the Sabbath. They still have the Sabbath. Probably always have, will have seven. So we're talking about changing doctrines. We're not talking about major changes in something like the Sabbath, the sacrifice of Jesus, having love for all people. No, they're, they've always been consistent in these basic doctrines. In this article, Coulter talks about their evolving understanding of law and grace. And, and I thought this was really interesting because we've got to be frank. Law and grace can be a difficult topic for many, many Christians. I know I don't have all the answers. And here's the chronology of Church of God Seventh Day's teaching on law and grace as related in Robert Coulter's article in the Bible Advocate. This is fascinating. He does his chronology. He says in 1860, when Church of God Seventh Day first started, here's what they taught on law and grace. And I'm going to quote, As principles, we shall maintain that sin entered the world and death by sin that man having sinned and the sentence of death having been passed upon him, he can have no hope of eternal life except through Christ. Okay, so far so good. That was 1860. Then we move on to 1888. Gilbert Cranmer, one of the founders of Church God Seventh Day, wrote, quote, Under the New Testament, as under the Old Testament, God demands that we show our faith by works. May we all love the law. Oh, may it be written in our hearts. End quote. Can you catch just a slightly different flavor from what they taught in 1860? Not a big change, but it's a nuanced change. Well, then by 1950, they seemed to shift back a little more to grace. The Bible <laughs> Advocate had an article by a fellow named I.M. Kramer, Kramer, who wrote, Law and justice demand satisfaction for offenses. Grace meets that satisfaction such is free grace, the gift of God through Christ. Then in 1917, the General Conference adopted somewhat of a change. Now get this. They said that salvation is received and maintained by works. And then they created these articles of faith. There were 40 statements of doctrine, nine of which dealt with salvation. And in this, the word grace appeared in none of the 40 statements of doctrine. Nowhere. Coulter's article points out that starting in 1949 and going on for the next 30 years, the Church of God Seventh Day 
place greater emphasis on works in their doctrine of salvation than on the grace of God. Well, then Coulter reports that in 1986, Church God Seventh Day started teaching that we are, quote, saved by grace through faith in the person and finished work of Jesus Christ. This grace and salvation demand our obedient response, end quote. And that's where they are today. Anyway, I found this brief history of Church God Seventh Day's evolving approach to law and grace to be fascinating because people like us who keep the Seventh Day Sabbath, we're constantly being challenged on how we reconcile law and grace. And sometimes, like the denomination Church God Seventh Day, we struggle to find the right balance. So I encourage you to write to the Bible, uh, write to the Bible Advocate, uh, and get this if you want to read their fascinating history. You can Google Church of God Seventh Day by simply typing Church of God Seventh Day General Conference, and then this latest issue of the Bible Advocate is online right now, so that you don't have to ask them to mail it to you. You can just download it from their website and get it just like that. And maybe someone in the chat room can post a link to this uh, issue um, on uh, in our chat room if you can get to it. Also, I want to hear uh, I, I want to hear some well thought out teachings. I'm sorry. If you want to hear some well thought out teachings on the subject of law and grace, Ron Dart has done a masterful job of explaining it. If you want to hear or read Ron Dart's teachings on law and grace, Google the following, <coughs> borntowin.net, law and grace. That's all you got to type, borntowin.net, law and grace. And a lot of things will pop up by Ron Dart. Check it out. I think you'll really be edified by this stuff. Okay, let's move on to our, um, uh, I think we're going into our third segment. Um, and um, now that we're, uh, we've briefly touched on... Um, the subject of grace and obedience. Let's get into our third and final segment. We talked about tonight's subject a little bit last week when I told you that since the Passover season is only a few weeks away, we need to talk about 1 Corinthians 11, 27 in depth because it's at this time of year that there are always questions about 1 Corinthians 11, 27. Let's start by reading what the <coughs> passage says. In 1 Corinthians 11, 27, in the King James it says, Wherefore, who, who, wherefore, whosoever shall eat this bread and drink this cup of the Lord unworthily shall be guilty of the blood and body of the Lord. Last week, we talked about who is worthy to take the Passover or Lord's Supper. And, and I know that we have different terminologies on this, just to let you know. On SOS, we use the terms Passover and Lord's Supper interchangeably. That is when we're talking about the annual taking of the symbols. And remember from last week that we said that no one, actually no one, is worthy of taking the bread and the cup. Only Jesus Christ is worthy. Jesus lived a perfect life. He died for our sins because no person who has ever existed has led a perfect life. And that means everybody needs the blood of Jesus to wash them clean. We're all sinners and the only thing we're worthy of is death. Now here's a little disclaimer. We're worthy of death until that moment when we accept Jesus as our Savior. And then at that moment, we become worthy through the sacrifice of the Lamb. Now, here's where I'm coming from on this subject. Every year at this time, as the Passover season approaches, we have Christians who read 1 Corinthians 11, 27, and they say something like this. I've heard them say this. I've had a bad year spiritually. And I did some pretty rotten things over this last year. I'm ashamed and embarrassed of my sins. I still have not overcome a bunch of things. I've sinned horribly. And I really wonder if I should even be taking the Passover because I might be taking it unworthily. Now, before we go any further, I want to get to the main point right away. Let's not wait till the end to say this. Let's be up front and really be clear on this. You need to partake of the symbols. The bread and the cup. No matter who you are, no matter what you've done, you need to take part of the bread and the cup. So now we've got the most important point out there. I don't care who you are, you need to partake of the symbols. Someone says, okay, but then what do we do with 1 Corinthians 11 27? They say, what's it talking about when it refers to taking the bread and the cup unworthily? And again, I want to admonish you something. I want to admonish you a little bit. 
some of you out there are at times a little bit too hard on yourself. Sometimes you're harder on yourself than God is. Not all the time, but sometimes you are. Sometimes you forget that God loves you. Sometimes you forget that God put you on this earth for the purpose of being reborn into his family. Sometimes you forget that God wants you to live forever with him and with his son, our Savior. And I want you to always remember that. This knowledge of God's love for you doesn't apply just to when we're talking about the bread and the cup. This knowledge of God's love for you applies to every doctrine that we examine. It applies to every conversation that we have regarding the great gift of salvation. So don't forget this point, ever. Keep in mind always, and keep it in mind tonight as we analyze 1 Corinthians 11, 27. Let's begin... <coughs> By looking at this scripture, let's look at it by making sure we completely understand the difference between a noun and a verb. What? Someone say, what, what, what? Noun and a verb? Why in the world is Wes talking about the basic parts of grammar when we're supposed to be discussing important spiritual principles? Please hang in there. I, I think you'll understand in a few moments. Because this is important. Don't, don't get all offended and leave us just yet. What's the difference? between a noun and a verb. A noun is a person, place, or thing. A verb is an action or a form of to be. And personally, I find it helpful in my spiritual life to always make sure I understand this concept, the difference between a noun and a verb. And why? Because as a Christian, I can hate verbs, but I cannot hate nouns if the nouns are people. And we've talked about this before, haven't we? What do we mean by that? Here's, here's what I mean. I can hate sinning, which is a verb, but I cannot hate the sinner, which is the noun. Can you see the difference? I can hate what a person is being hypocritical, committing adultery, telling lies. These are all verbs. But I cannot hate the person, even if he is a hypocrite, an adulterer, and a liar, because he's a noun, he's a person. And, and, you know, actually, we take it a step further. Maybe we shouldn't. Nancy and I, we will not disrespect any person who is a noun by calling him names. When you watch this show, you don't hear any name calling. And if you know us personally, you know that we try really, really hard not to do this name calling thing that some Christians love to do, and they think it's perfectly all right to do it. So, again, we don't call a person a hypocrite or an adulterer or a liar. Here's what we do instead. We say, he has been hypocritical. He has committed adultery or he has told lies. Can you see the difference? All right, here's more. On, on SOS, we condemn false doctrines, bad actions, and wrong teachings. But we don't condemn the people who promote false doctrines, bad actions, and wrong teachings. Can you see the difference? While we do condemn the actions, it's not our job to judge the people. The job of judging people is the exclusive domain of our Savior, Jesus. Let's demonstrate this further. What kind of word is unworthily? It's an adverb. An adverb describes a verb. Does an adverb ever describe a noun? No, never. An adverb can never describe a noun. What does describe a noun? An adjective describes a noun. When we see the word unworthily in 1 Corinthians 11, 27, it's describing a verb, an action. It is not describing a noun, a person. In other words, the word unworthily in 1 Corinthians 11, 27 has nothing to do with people. It has everything to do with the actions of people. If Paul in 1 Corinthians 11, 27 wanted to describe nouns, people, us, he would have said, no unworthy person can keep the bread and the cup. But he didn't say that. His phraseology didn't imply unworthy, which is an adjective that describes a noun. He used the word unworthily, which is describing a verb, an action. Again, Paul is not talking about people in this passage. He's talking about the actions of people. He's talking about how people keep the Lord's Supper. He's talking about the method of keeping the Lord's Supper. He's talking about the attitude when keeping the Lord's Supper. So, let's ask the question. 
How can we keep the Lord's Supper unworthily? Or another way of putting it, how can we keep the Lord's Supper in an unworthy manner? And this is the crux of the matter. This is what 1 Corinthians 11, 27 is talking about. Not the person keeping the Lord's Supper, but the manner in which he keeps it. So again, question, how can you keep the Lord's Supper in an unworthy manner? What does it mean to take the Lord's Supper unworthily? Here's an example. If I take the Lord's Supper just to satisfy my physical hunger, because I just happen to have a hankering for some bread and wine, that's keeping it in an unworthy manner, or keeping it unworthily. Or how about this? If I take the Lord's Supper, and I don't believe it. If I say, you know, I really don't believe that Jesus died for my sins, but I'm going to do the Lord's Supper anyway just to keep my wife happy or to keep my friends happy. If I do that, I'm keeping it in an unworthy manner or unworthily. But what if I say this? What if I say this? I am a sinner. I've committed some dreadful sins over the past year. I want to ask God for mercy, that mercy that I don't deserve. I want forgiveness, forgiveness that I don't deserve. What if that's what's in my heart? If that's what's in my heart, then I'm taking the Lord's Supper worthily or in a worthy manner. I'm still not worthy, but I'm taking it worthily or in a worthy manner. Again, all of this, 1 Corinthians 11, 27, has to do with the verb and not the noun. So if you're going to remember one thing from the show tonight, please remember that you most certainly not are, uh, uh, most assuredly are not worthy of the Lord's Supper. None of us is worthy. But you should still take it. Because when you have a heart of repentance, a heart of contrition, you're taking it in a worthy manner. And I'm going to say this again, and I, I worry sometimes that y'all get tired of me saying this on the show, because I really, really enjoy saying this. God loves you. God created you because he wants you to be reborn into his family and live forever with him and his son, Jesus. And for that very, very important reason, God wants you at the Lord's Supper. Now, let's pause here. Let's take a deep breath. If you know someone who used to keep the Lord's Supper but doesn't do it anymore, I want you to call him. Invite him to the Lord's Supper. Tell him you'd like to share the symbols of the bread and the cup with him. And if he at any time indicates or even hints that he shouldn't be keeping the Passover because he's unworthy, you take him to 1 Corinthians eleven twenty seven and help him to understand that God loves him and that God wants him to be at the Lord's Supper. All right, here's another point. If you don't have anywhere to go for the Lord's Supper, Contact us at DCM. And I'll bet we just might be able to find a group near you that would welcome you to keep the Lord's Supper with them. I can't promise it, but we would really, really try real hard. And now that I've admonished you to take action, let's not stop. Let's keep going. Because I'm not here to just titillate your love for academia and history. I'm here on this show to point you to Christ. I'm here to encourage you to obey what Jesus teaches. And that's why I want to say this. If you're listening to this show tonight and you aren't Baptist and aren't baptized. We don't care if you're Baptist. No, no, no. If you're, if you're, if you're not baptized, I've got a question for you. What are you waiting for? What are you waiting for? Why don't you give it some consideration so that you can take the Lord's Supper this year? Get busy. <laughs> why put it off and say, well, I'll get baptized next year. And then I'll keep the Lord's Supper next year. No, keep it this year. And again, if you want to be baptized and don't know of a minister in the area where you live, contact us at Dynamic Christian Ministries, and I'll bet that we might be able to find someone in your area to baptize you. So contact us. And finally, maybe someone that you love, friend, relative, neighbor, maybe that person is thinking about baptism. If so, encourage him to take that step. Tell him he needs to covenant with Christ. Encourage him to get baptized. And again, if you contact us, I think we might possibly find someone in that person's area who could baptize him. So here's your chance. Here's your chance to serve others. Here's your chance to promote the good news of the kingdom of God. Here's your chance to bring people into the God family. Are you willing to do this? We don't ask a lot from you. We don't ask you for money. Mm -mm. We ask for prayers, 
and, and we ask for you to hit the share button. Yeah, prayers and shares. So if you haven't hit the share button tonight, we ask, please, hit the share button. It'd be a good time to do it right now. It'd be a good time to do it right now. So we don't ask for much. And tonight I'm asking, I'm going to do it different. I'm going to ask for other stuff from you. I'm not going to ask because we're going to benefit from these things that we're asking. No, the benefit is going to come to you and your loved ones. So it's with no shame, no embarrassment, that I'm asking for something tonight from you. I'm asking you to participate in this important matter. Are you willing to do your part in promoting the gospel message? Tell these people, get baptized. Tell these people, keep the Passover. And let's put in a little clarification. As you know, we're not a church. Dynamic Christian Ministry is not a church. We don't have members. don't have a mailing list. We're just a small ministry. But we love all people. We love those folks who are in all these other organizations called UCG and COGWA and CG7 and CGI and all that. And because we love these people, that's why we love to send people who watch our show, we send them to these groups. Now, are we giving our endorsement to everything that these groups do? Of course not. We have differences of opinion with these people on things, but that, that doesn't mean they're not our brothers. We're brothers. We're supposed to love each other. So if, if we send you to some church, try to get along with them. Please don't come back to me later and say, well, I didn't like some of their teachings and you sent me over there. When you ask us for a place to go, we do our best to find a group for you. We don't ask that you necessarily agree to everything they do. Just keep the Passover, Lord's Supper with them peacefully if they'll let you in. Check them out. If you like them, stay. If you don't, keep looking. But in this whole exercise... There's no need to get upset or angry or offended. Let's be kind to each other. Let's have love for one another. Let's fellowship with each other whenever possible and do it peacefully. So contact us if you need baptism or a place to partake, to partake of the symbols. Here's my email. WDWhite49 at yahoo.com. Let me say it again. WDWhite49 at yahoo.com. Write to me if you need a place to keep the Lord's Supper. Write to me if you know someone who wants to be, bapt uh, be baptized. And if there's any way that we can serve you, we want to serve you. So get in touch with us. Okay, I think we've still got Bill on the line. Bill, we've talked about brethren who have left the faith tonight. Would you please talk to our audience about this business of falling away? Yes, good stuff. And I'd like to add that the spiritual wilderness can be a very very dark place. Yeah. But the publican found mercy and the Pharisee did not. He confessed his sins and asked for mercy. It's a fair once there. We are often the worst judge of ourselves. And so whether it is yourself or if you know anyone that has been a brother or a sister in the faith who has gone astray or has stopped coming to church, uh, to church perhaps, the Lord's Supper is a wonderful time to reach out to those people. <clears throat> An opportunity for all of us to wash each other's feet, to wash away sin that we have done to each other, perhaps. Those who have been forgotten, isolated, or they're just suffering quietly in spiritual despair. And may I recommend, like Wes said, to reach out to those people and invite them to that Lord's Supper. Let them know they're still loved and welcomed, and that there is a place for them there. It is a great form of evangelism. People have already tasted, perhaps, of the fruits of the Spirit. The spiritual wilderness, cold, bitter, lonely place. But Jesus spoke about leaving the 99 sheep to go after the lost one. Use the communion of the Last Supper as an outreach to those who have become lost. It's an excellent time to help people to find redemption, hope, and renewal. And isn't that why God called us to be a part of that process Amen. in helping the lost sheep? Yeah, you mentioned a good thing about how the foot washing and, and, and the Passover uh, thing we go through. It's a time to wash away sins, but it's also a time to be washing away grudges. Isn't that right, Bill? Oh, no, absolutely. Indeed. And, and may I again add that for those of you that are watching on Seventh-day Sabbath Keepers, contact me there. Contact West at Dynamic Christian <coughs> Ministries. We will help you find somewhere to attend. If there's nowhere to attend, we'll even find good online services for you to participate with. But it's best, of course, to be, you know, brother with brother, sister with sister. We are there as a ministry to help all of you find a place of, uh, to be planted and to grow 
to be loved and to serve. That's right. Very good. Thank you, Bill. Nancy, do we have any comments in the chat room? I do. I want to read uh, a couple that Bernard Carmen left us. But I, I want to mention that Xavier St. Hope posted a lot of great topical, topical scriptures about uh, baptism and uh, examining yourself in the Lord's Supper. So just, just you can do your own Bible study in what Xavier St. Hope posted. in the chat room, right? In the chat room. And they're going to be there forever and ever because we don't delete what's in that's the right, chat room, right. okay? So if you can't get to them tonight, come back tomorrow or tomorrow night and look <laughs> at them. If Xavier's got some good scriptures in there, amen. Come back. They're going to be there forever and ever for you to look at. Bernard, thank you, Xavier. Yes, thank you for posting those. Bernard Carmen says, unfortunately, it seems that an awful lot of condem condem no, condemnation perpetuates among brethren for how to observe Passover, which calendar one is using, and more recently, there's a growing t trend to condemn one another for how they voted. It's very sad, and many brethren are being hurt. I pray God will help more brethren come to the understanding that Wes has been sharing here. Okay. Some among our brethren <clears throat> wholeheartedly believe that taking the Passover over unworthily is mostly related to whether or not the individual is properly baptized. While I entirely agree that one ought to be baptized if they are taking the Passover, I also agree that one ought to be baptized if they are following Christ. I just don't agree with policing those who are called to observe the Passover. After all, during the Exodus Passover, all members of the family were part of the process of being under the blood of the future Messiah. <coughs> And I think some churches do, uh, like like they do a tie check, they do a baptism check yeah. if you come new and make sure. But a lot of churches don't. I think they've gotten away from that, assuming this is your relationship yeah. with Christ. Yeah, let, 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 me, let me talk about this real quickly, and you look up the next comment if you would. In the old days, in the old organization, if you came in there, even if you came from another church that baptized you and laid hands on you, you had to be rebaptized. And I believe that uh, the, someone told me that the Seventh-day Adventists, if you came from uh, a Sabbath-keeping group and you want to go into the Seventh-day Adventists, they make you get rebaptized. Somebody check that out and let me know if I... I don't want to be making up lies about Seventh-day Sabbath or Seventh-day Adventists, but that's what I heard. But here's the deal on baptism. We in the ministry can only advise you. We cannot dictate it because your relationship between you and Jesus is between you and Jesus. Amen. And if you say that your baptism was valid, that you had 15 years ago with this organization, and I don't feel I need to be rebaptized coming into this organization, then that's the way it ought to be because it's between you and Jesus. Now, that being said, let me give a little qualifier in there. The way I advise people, and I don't dictate, I ask when you were baptized, you were fully immersed, yeah, did you have hands laid upon you? And if they say no, I say, then we should lay hands on you. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. You don't necessarily have to be rebaptized. Because didn't we have in the, in the Gospels where, where they ran into people who were baptized okay. by John the Baptist, and they didn't have hands laid on them, and the, the, the uh, disciples didn't rebaptize them, they just laid hands on them. So if anybody can find that scripture, put, uh, put it out there on the website. But anyway, the bottom line to all this is no man can dictate to you whether or not your baptism is valid. Don't ever let anyone tell you that your baptism is not valid. Mm -hmm. It's up to you. Now, you, you've got to listen to other people because in the multitude of counsel, there's wisdom. The ministry is out there to serve you and advise you. But we are not to dictate to you. And if you're being dictated to and stuff like this, Never mind, I'll shut up at that point. Okay, what else you got? Bernard points out that uh, with your long hair and his, some congregations wouldn't even let you in. So That's right. It's yeah, true. Yeah. Bernard, he's, he's a good friend of mine. I've known him for years. And believe it or not, he's actually got hair longer than mine. That's right. And Bernard and I are constantly taking it over our long hair. And people are constantly getting on us about this. But we just continue on our merry way, don't we, Bernard? We don't let it bother us. There you go. And uh, sometimes I think we do it just to aggravate them, but I would never admit that. So, anyway. And, and Bernard brings up a point that, uh, in a very kind and, you know, non-aggressive way, just uh, just stating of his own belief, that he prefers the term Passover to Lord's Supper. Okay. You should probably mention that there. People go back and forth yes. on that. And how should we handle this? 
in love. Yeah. If someone says Passover or someone uses Lord's Supper, then we should um, we should not yeah, yeah, you know, let, have a fit about right, it. Let's talk about that because in Church God Seventh Day, I was in there for like I don't know if it was five or six years, whatever it was. When I got there, I learned that they don't call it Passover; they call it Lord's Supper. They said, Wes, the Passover is tomorrow night. And, you know, that's a subject we could get into uh, and talk about it a lot if you want to. And they were correct, Passover's the next night. But Jesus said, I have desired to keep this Passover with you. So on the early 14th, when we keep the Lord's Supper, we think of it as Passover. So some people will only call it Passover. Some will call it only Lord's Supper. Some of us will refer to it as either. So I go in Church of God Seventh Day. <clears throat> I find out that they're going to keep their Lord's Supper and they're going to have grape juice and unleavened bread. And some other, excuse me, people from worldwide came in and boy, <coughs> did they have a fit. They said, no, you got to have wine. So we had a big old Bible study about it, big old controversy. And then um, they said, well, why can't you have one tray of wine and one tray of grape, grape juice? And I said to these people, being a former worldwider that I am, I said, look, don't come in this group trying to change them. This is the way they do it. Right. Leave them alone. If you can't take grape juice, you got to have your fermented wine. Go somewhere else. But quit bugging these people and trying to get them to change into the way that sure. you want them to do it. we got to have love for each other. We've got to have tolerance. And if somebody does something different, and if it, you either accept it nicely, kindly, without griping, or go somewhere else. Okay? we got to we got to show... Uh, good manners in, in this stuff okay i just want to mention a few more things uh okay. jean beverly king says hello from cgi in ocho rio saint Anne, jamaica ah jamaica hi shakela uh, cornelius asked for prayers for her leg who shakela shakala cornelius okay we'll say ms Cornel cornelius um, okay. Prayers for her leg. Okay. And uh, Mark Salas says, Someone I love deeply has <clears throat> fallen away. God knows the person. Please pray with me that this person turns back to God. Thanks. Okay. And who requests this? Mark? Mark Salas. Okay. Let's remember Mark. Okay. Very good. Okay. And those requests are in there too. So please put those two things on your, your prayer list, uh, brethren. Jeffrey and Flum. Acts 8, 17 to, 16 to 17. Good old Jeffrey. For as yet he had fallen upon none of them, or it, uh, meaning it, I guess. Yeah. Uh -huh. Only they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. They laid their hands on them and they received the Holy Ghost. Very good. That was Acts what? 8, 16 to 17. Oh, I thought it was in one of the Gospels. Thank no, no, you, no, Jeffrey. Was... Yeah, you're right. You're, I shouldn't have said that. Thank you, Jeffrey. You you saved the day for us. Okay. Uh, Carl posted Acts 19, 1 through 6, so maybe he talks about it in another place. So okay, very good. He doesn't good. quote it. He just quoted it. All right. Thank and so you. that's going to be it for it. If I miss your name, we still love you. We're glad you're there and that you stuck with us through the evening. Yeah. Thank you. As, as usual, Nancy made us go overtime. Yeah, that's because right. Her, me talking too much. Her presentation just went on and on and on. Yeah. So thank you, Nancy. Uh, what else do we have here? Oh, I think we're ready we're, to wrap up. We're ready to wrap it up. Bill, are you ready to close with prayer, please? Oh, are you asking me, Wes? Yes, Bill, would you mind? Right. Oh, wait a minute. Before, uh, before he does... Uh, wait. Wait. Pray. Okay, hold on, Bill. Hold on just a second. Someone said there was too much bass. Can you adjust that a little bit? Too much bass on Bill? Yes. Okay. All right, let me try this. Hold so on. So we don't want them to miss the prayer or be uh, unable to There's the bass. And we want a little more treble. Say, uh, do a test, Bill. Testing one, two, three. All right, let's see if that's better. Okay. All right. All right, if you'll all bow your heads, we'll go before the Lord. All right, here we go. Father in heaven... Thank you again for this opportunity for the rest, for the Sabbath rest, for letting Jesus Christ into our life and to have this day to take a pause from our worldly pursuits and for the curses of this life in many ways. Father, thank you for the refreshment of this day and the, the, the new water and the new life that it represents and the kingdom of God that is coming. Well, thank you very much for it, Father. Thank you for this. Uh, opportunity to get together with us here on Start Our Sabbath. What a wonderful thing it is this technology that you've given us to where we can have friends and meet in spirit together around the world. What an amazing thing it is. And we ask you again to bless the outreach and all the people that are here and all of our brothers everywhere on earth and members of the Ecclesia that we can get the job done to preach your gospel of the world unto every creature. And so, Father, help us with that. Thank you for letting us be involved 
with this miracle, this process of bringing human beings into godly glory. Thank you for the calling. Be with us this day. Help us to remember to keep it holy. And we do pray this and oh, one more thing, Father. Many requests this evening from our friends in the chat room for illnesses and for ministries and, and the like. Please bless them and help them, Father. We do love them and, and are concerned for all. And be with those that are having issues and doubts and self-image problems and just are being attacked by Satan himself that they come and fellowship with those on the Lord's Supper, the Passover, if you will, to celebrate together. Be with them, Father. Be with all of us in spirit. Empower us as always through the Holy Spirit. And we do pray in the name of our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. 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 Okay, wait till you back the thing up so we can all say goodnight to them. They so everybody can see uh, everybody who was here on the show. Sorry we can't have Bill here with you. But, but we do have a picture of him. We do have a picture of Bill. It, it's not a very good picture, but I don't think he there takes you know. a good picture. There you go. Isn't that right, Bill? Poor Bill. I'll get you another picture. No, I'm just kidding. We're just, we're just yanking your chain. I need the one where it looks like, uh, I'll send you one. You, you make your decision. You can pick them up. I, I think it's a good picture. Okay, uh, so uh, there we got Karen and Wayne, uh, right. our technical people, and Carl. We can't get you on the camera, That's right. but uh, we should send us you. a picture. Yeah, you should, Carl, send us a picture. Would you do that so we can get that out there and everybody can see what? Hey, you're Bernard, looking. if you're still there, uh, I get a lot of grief over having no hair. <laughs> <laughs> we're we're kind of alike. People cannot be happy. Yes, yin and yang here. Okay. All right. So our final advice to you tonight is. Have a good Sabbath. All right. Good night. Careful, Bill. We're still online.